So good afternoon. I want to welcome everyone who zoomed in to what promises to be a fascinating conversation with Frank Wilderson, Professor Frank Wilderson, on the topic of the politics of pessimism in an anti-Black world. Can't imagine a, a more opportune time to think about some of these things. Um, my name is Joseph Winters. I am a professor at Duke University in the departments of religious studies and African and African American studies. I am one of the co-moderators um, this afternoon alongside Anne Maria Mukuru, um, who is a professor in cultural anthropology and African and African American studies. This actually, this event is part of a, a, an ongoing uh, year long set of um, uh, speaker series, uh, kind of you know talks around issues of blackness, politics, health, and so forth, right? Um, associated with the Department of African and African American Studies. Um, I wanna give some thanks and shout outs um, uh, to, the, to the two co-sponsors uh, for this event. Uh, that, uh, one is the Department of African and African American Studies. The other is the John Hope Franklin Humanities Institute, both at Duke University. I wanna thank very much their support um, you know, uh, and help in organizing this, this event with Professor Wilderson. Uh, I wanna especially thank at the Department of African and African American Studies, uh, Mark Anthony Neal and Tyra Dixon, and at the Franklin Humanities Institute, Ranji Khanna, Sarah Rogers, um, and Pamela Montgomery. Also want to thank our guest, uh, obviously, uh, Professor Wilderson, and also um, <clears throat> Elizabeth Cole at Evil Twin Booking Agency. So right now, we're gonna do, I'm going to give a brief introduction uh, of our guest, Professor Wilderson, and then uh, Professor Wilderson will give maybe about a 12, 15 uh, minute reading of one of the excerpts uh, of an excerpt from his recent book, Afro-Pessimism. And then Professor Makuru and myself will have some qu questions that we've prepared. And then while we're doing that, we're also gonna be gathering questions um, uh, in the Q&A from the audience. <clears throat> Frank B. Wilderson III is professor and chair of African-American studies and a core faculty member of the culture and theory PhD program at UC Irvine. Professor Wilderson is an award-winning writer whose books include right, um, uh, Afro-Pessimism, right, uh, published by Liver, uh, uh, Liverwright, W.W. Norton in 2020, um, Red, White, and Black, Cinema and the Structure of U.S. Antagonisms at Duke, Uni Duke University Press in 2010, and Incognito, a memoir of exile and apartheid in um, 2008, I think reprinted in 2015. That's also by Duke University Press. Professor Wilderson spent five and a half years in South Africa, I think between 1991 and 96, where he was one of the two Americans to hold elected office in the African National Congress during the apartheid era. He also was a cadre in the underground. His literary awards include the American Book Award, the Zora Neale Hurston slash Richard Wright Legacy Award for Creative Nonfiction, the Maya Angelou Award for Best Fiction Portraying the Black Experience in America, and a National Endowment for the Arts Literature Fellowship. Wilson was educated at Dartmouth College where he got an AB in, in, in Government and Philosophy, Columbia University where he got an MFA in Fiction Writing, and UC Berkeley where he got a PhD uh, in Rhetoric and I believe Film Studies. Uh, on a personal note, um, <clears throat> I've, I've learned a lot from um, you know, Professor, Wilderson's, <clears throat> Professor Wilderson's work um, over the years, he's definitely re reshaped how I think about black studies, black studies and the relationship between uh, blackness and the human. And I've been very fortunate to, to talk about his work at Duke University with colleagues like Anne-Marie Makudu and also uh, Professor uh, uh, Patrice Douglas. So without further ado, I'm gonna be quiet and um, you know, allow Professor, uh, Professor Wilderson uh, to speak from his text, Afro-Pessimism. Hi, Joseph, good to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. And um, I want to just say, as on a personal note, uh, first of all, thank you to everyone in your in your um, your cadre at Duke who made this possible for me to be here. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's our second try. I would love to have been at Duke um, in person, but this is the next best thing. And uh, you and I spent uh, a few days together in in a closed room with uh, several Black theologians at uh, Wabash uh, back in, uh, well, my goodness, was that 2019? Uh, About a, a year ago, exactly a year ago at this time. Yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. And uh, it really opened my eyes to the possibilities um, and interventions of, of radical Black theology. So I've learned a lot from you also. I really appreciate that. 
Um, as we as we discussed, um, I'm going to jump right in with uh, an excerpt, and I I won't give too much of a preamble to this excerpt, except except to say that I think um, it makes some interventions uh, in terms of the cognitive mapping of of the times that we're in now. Uh, as many people know, the way the book is structured is that there are, are huge moments of, of memoir and creative writing storytelling, and then um, you blend into uh, a critical theory intervention. And so what I'm going to read are uh, about six pages from a critical theory intervention that comes after uh, an episode that took place uh, um, about 19 years ago. I was about 45 years old, a graduate student at UC Berkeley, and uh, in a van to the airport, uh, I was going in a van to the airport from Berkeley to the Oakland airport with a Pakistani driver a, uh, and two white um, progressive slash radicals. And what the uh, imbroglio of that ride showed me was the way in which uh, the grammar of suffering between the colored immigrant and the uh, white working class person on one side cannot be reconciled with the grammar of suffering of uh, the black uh, sentient being. And so I'm not gonna talk about the story itself. Many people have already read the story, um, but I'm going to go into this part of the book that comes right after the story. And then we can talk about people's response to this. It is absolutely necessary for blacks to be castrated, raped, genitally mutilated and violated, beaten, shot, and maimed. It is, and it is necessary for this to take place in the streets as well as in popular culture, as on TV and in the cinema. Blacks can even be genocided, but only up to a point. Because unlike Indians, Blacks are not in possession of something exterior to themselves that civil society wants. Civil society does not, does not want Black land as it wants Indian land, that it might distinguish the nation from Turtle Island. It does not want Black consent as it wants working class consent, that it might distinguish a capitalist economic system from a socialist one, that it might extract surplus value and turn that value into profit. What civil society wants and needs from black people is far more essential, far more fundamental than land and profits. What civil society needs from black people is confirmation of human existence. It would be mis misguided, even mendacious, to have said to the people in that van ride to the airport that the Patriot Act, which had just been passed a few months before in October of 2001, it would be a misguided to say that the Patriot Act did not affect Black people or to champion any anti-immigration sentiment of any sort. But it would be just as misguided and mendacious to suggest that the Patriot Act's relative corruption of the integrity of the Bill of Rights or the relative rigidity or, or elasticity of access to and within the institutionality of civil society can help us think through Black folks' unique grammar of suffering. Put another way, black thought and therefore black liberation is threatened not only by the state, but by the interests and actions of the loyal opposition, otherwise known as the progressive and radical left. First, there is the terrorism of what Gramsci referred to as political society, the police, the army, the prison industrial complex. Second, there is the terror of civil society's hegemonic blocks and its clusters of affilial formations like the mainstream media, the university, and the megachurch. But there is also a third tier of terror with which black thought must contend. And that is the terror of counter hegemonic and revolutionary thought, the logic of white feminism, the logic of working class struggle, the logic of multicultural coalitions, the logic of immigrant rights, the unrelenting terror elaborated whenever black people's so-called allies think out loud. The stakes of this three-tiered terror are high because of their impact 
upon Black people's capacity to capture and be captured by our own imaginations. See, these three tiers scaffold the death of Black desire. And our capacity to imagine and to fantasize while assuming our position is imbricated in our capacity to think theoretically, to give our political desire objective value. There's something organic to Blackness that makes it essential to the construction of civil society. But there's also something organic to Blackness that portends the destruction of civil society. There's nothing willful or speculative in this statement, for one could just as well state the claim the other way around, which is to say there's something organic to civil society that makes it essential to the destruction of the Black body. Blackness is a positionality of absolute dereliction, abandonment in the face of civil society, and therefore cannot be liberated cannot be liberated or be made legible through counter hegemonic interventions. Black suffering is not, a, is not a function of the performances of civil society, but of the existence of civil society. For the Pakistani driver in the van, the white professor and his white wife, for all three of them, civil society is an ensemble of constraints and opportunities, but for the black, civil society is a murderous projection. The violence of capitalism or any human paradigm of subjection for that matter has a prehistory. In other words, it takes an ocean of violence to transpose serfs into workers. It takes an ocean of violence over a couple hundred years to discipline them into temporalities that are new and more constricting and to have them imagine their lives within new constraints like urbanization, mechanization, and certain types of labor practices. But once the system is set up- Okay, sorry. I found this on the web for <laughs> certain types of labor practices. Well, that's my artificial intelligence speaking. So <laughs> let me go on. Um, uh, but once the system is set up, then violence recedes and goes into remission. The violence comes back at times when capitalism needs to regenerate itself or when the workers transgress the rules and push back, that is to say, when they withdraw their consent. But the violence of the slave estate cannot be thought of the way one thinks of the violence of capitalist oppression. It takes an ocean of violence to produce a slave, singular or plural, but that violence never goes into remission. Again, the prehistory of violence that establishes slavery is also the concurrent history of slavery. This is a difficult cognitive map for most activists to adjust to because it actually takes the problem outside of politics. Politics is a very rational endeavor, which allows activists to work out models that predict the structural violence of capitalism in its performative manifestations. But you cannot create models that predict the structural violence of slavery in its performative manifestations. What the Marxists do with slavery is they try to show how the violence, how violence is connected to production. And that means they are not really thinking about the violence of slavery comprehensively. The violence of social death or slavery is actually subtended to the production of the psychic health of all those who are not slaves. Something that cannot be literally commodified or weighted on an actual balance sheet. That's the, that's the more intangible libidinal aspect of anti-Black violence. In other words, Activists want to make sense of the death of Sandra Bland, Bland, the murders of Michael Brown and Eric Gardner, when what these spectacles require in order to be adequately explained is a theory of nonsense, their absence of a tangible or rational utility. Black people are not murdered for transgressions such as illegal immigration or workplace agitation. The essential utility of Black death is, paradoxically, the absence of utility. Black death now does have a certain utility. 
but it is not subtended by the extraction of surplus value, not in any fundamental way. And it is certainly not subtended by the usurpation of land. Black death is subtended by the psychic integration of everyone who is not black. Black death functions as national therapy, even though the rhetoric that explains and laments these deaths expresses this psychic dependence, not directly, but symptomatically. It is complex, but it is simple too. Blacks are not going to be genocided like Native Americans. We are being genocided, but genocided and regenerated because the spectacle of black death is essential to the mental health of the world. We cannot be wiped out completely because our deaths must be repeated visually. The bodily mutilation of blackness is necessary, so it must be repeated. What we are witnessing on YouTube, Instagram, and the nightly news as murders are rituals of healing for civil society, rituals that stabilize and ease the anxiety that other people feel in their daily lives. It's the anxiety that people have walking around. It cannot be stable. It can be stabilized by a lot of different things like marijuana, cocaine, alcohol, love affairs. But the ultimate stabilization of this anxiety is the spectacle of violence against Blacks. I know I am human because I am not Black. I know I am not Black because when and if I experience the kind of violence Blacks experience, there is a reason, some contingent transgression. This is why online video posts of police murdering Black people contribute more to the psychic well-being of non-Black people, to their communal pleasures and sense of ontological presence than they contribute to deterrence, arrests, or even to a general sensitivity of Black pain and suffering. Afro-pessimism helps us understand why the violence that saturates Black life is not threatened with elimination just because it is exposed. For this to be the case, the spectator, interlocutor, or auditor would have to come to images such as Black mutilation with an unconscious that could perceive injury in such images. In other words, the mind would have to see a person with a heritage of rights and claims whose rights and claims are being violated. This is not the way slaves, Blacks, function in the collective unconscious. Slaves function as, as implements in the collective unconscious. Whoever heard of an injured plow? Afro-pessimism is premised on the iconoclastic claim that Blackness is coterminous with slaveness. Blackness is social death, which is to say that there was never a prior moment of plenitude, never a moment of equilibrium, never a moment of social life. Blackness as a paradigmatic position, rather than as an ensemble of identities, rather than as an ensemble of cultural practices, rather than as anthropological accoutrement. Blackness as a paradigmatic position cannot be disimbricated from slavery. The narrative arc of the slave who is Black, unlike the generic slave who may be of any race, is not a narrative arc at all. But a flat line, as Hortense Spillers has written, of historical stillness, a flat line that moves from disequilibrium to a moment of narrative faux equilibrium to disequilibrium restored or rearticulated. To put it differently, the violence that's, that elaborates and saturates Black life is totalizing, so much so as to make narrative inaccessible to Blacks. That is not simply a problem for Black people. It is a problem for the organizational calculus of critical theory and radical politics writ large. Fundamental to the cognitive maps of radical politics is a belief that all sentient beings can be protagonists within a political or personal narrative, that every sentient being arrives with a history. This belief is underwritten by another idea that constitutes narrative, that all sentient beings can be redeemed. 
History and redemption are the weave of narrative. As provocative as it may sound, history and redemption, and therefore narrative itself, are inherently anti-Black. Without the presence of a being who is ab initio, barred from redemption, a being that is generally dishonored, natally alienated, and open to naked violence, history and narrative would lack their touchstones of cohesion. Without the Black, one would not be able to know what a world devoid of redemption looks like. And if one could not conceive of the absence of redemption, then redemption would be inconceivable as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Wilderson, for those, uh, um, you know, for that, for that reading. Um, th th there's so much in there, uh, in, in that reading, in your thought, uh, you know, um, in your reflections. I want to start um, with a question about libidinal economy, right? which is, it, it, it seems to me, even if that, that, that wasn't the term that was used, the way that you're thinking about a, a kind of violence that happens right to, to blackness that happens to the subject of the black, which doesn't have an analogy. Right? So, if there's something about the exploitation, like for instance, of let's say labor, right, which you which you've thought, which you certainly think about, is something we should think about. The exploitation of labor, you've said, does have something like a kind of concrete end, which is something like you know accumulation of profit, accumulation of, of wealth. Whereas, the right and, and certainly black people are workers, but the kind of violence against blacks qua blackness has something to do with the psychic coherence of the human, right? So if you could just say, maybe just say a little bit more about libidinal economy, its connection to political economy, right? And, and how you're thinking, because for me, at least, I think that that is a crucial dimension of, of, of one of many crucial dimensions and interventions um, that, that um, Afro-pessimism uh, makes to, to the conversation, to conversations within critical theory. <laughs> yes, well, thank you for that. Um, I mean, I, th I think, you know, if we had a lot of time, what we would, <laughs> you know, like weeks, because it's, it's, a, it's a question that would take, that takes weeks, but let's, so I, I can't actually prove the assertions, but I will make the assertions. And, um, and then people will then go to the writings of, you know, people at your own campus, like yourself and Patrice and Jared Sexton and, and, and especially David Marriott for this, question and uh, Sadia Hartman's uh, chapter on, on rape um, is, is in particular in Scenes of Subjection. Um, so let's start from the back. Afro-pessimism does not, as a critique of Marxism and psychoanalysis, it's an, it's an assessment, which is, does not then say these paradigmatic cognitive maps bear no import for Black suffering. No, it's, it, what it's saying is that these are paradigmatic instantiations and cognitive maps that explains an aspect of how Black people suffer. So it's very, they're very important, but they do not explain the essence of Black suffering. So, it's, so when I'm talking about these things as not being able to adequately explain black suffering, I'm always using, the, I'm always got this shorthand that I should always probably use. And the shorthand is essential because a lot of people think that we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater and that's not the case. I was very instrumental in revamping the entire curriculum of culture and theory so that everyone has to read Das Kapital and Capitalism in their first quarter here, we're on the quarter system. And then the next quarter, everyone has to read Lacan and, and Marx before you can get to a project of chopping them down at the knees and saying what's, what's wrong with respect to black suffering. You gotta go through that. So, and I'm deeply invested in that. But what I'm not invested in is a sense that you can explain, and this is where blackness differs from everyone else. Everyone else, as a par paradigm of suffering, whether it's a colored immigrant, whether it's a post-colonial subject, uh, queer theory, uh, working class, there is embedded in the rhetorical structure of the ism, Marxism, feminism, whatever, a descriptive gesture, which is how does this body suffer? Which is not about what do these bodies think about their suffering? How does this body suffer? And that's a completely different question. Personally, I'm not, 
as interested in what people who suffer think about their suffering as I am in the structure of their suffering. Okay, then, but then there comes another aspect, which is the answer to Lenin's question, what is to be, to be done? And that's the prescriptive gesture. And so in radical feminism, what is to be done is to destroy Oedipus and remap kinship in an egalitarian way, which is not heteronormative. In Marxism, what is to be done is to destroy uh, capitalism and remap political economy in, in, in a communist modality. But if you say that the capacity to make a world is more essential than the capacity to make an economic world, then you're on another plane. And so what we're saying is that the capacity to make world is human capacity. And that is in the fifth chapter of, of, of Fanon's Black Skin, White Mask, he talks, he says this, and, and Fanon, I'm hijacking Fanon as an Afro-pessimist. Fanon is a humanist. He's rolling over in his grave uh, listening to what uh, I have done with his work, okay? That's okay. When I want to read Fanon, I don't go to Fanon. I go to David Marriott, who's a better Fanonian than Fanon, okay? But <laughs> be that as it may. <laughs> You know, I want to when I get when I die, I'm gonna go to heaven and tell Fernand that, that we helped your ass read your shit better. Okay. <laughs> and so <laughs> so we'll just leave that aside right now. Fernand ain't agreeing with me, okay? But he makes a statement in which he says the black has no ontological resistance in the eyes of the white. And that is the germ of Afro-pessimism. It's ontological resistance, which is to say, I give you the capacity to name endless space, to, to, to name space into place. As a white person, your capacity is inferior to mine. So if you call this Turtle Island and you call it Olani Land, I'm giving you that capacity. I recognize you as a degraded form of human being. You have the capacity. It's just, I had to come along like the, like the Israelis say to, to, the, to the Palestinians. I had to come along and make the desert bloom. I had to give you a better, more exalted form of dealing with spatiality. But I recognize you can do that. It's just that you don't know how to do it like me. I also recognize that you can turn endless duration into the event, the event at the smallest scale. Right now in California, it says two o'clock. That is not two o'clock anywhere in the world. That's a, that's a human construction agreed upon by ontological resistance, which is called consensus building, okay? There's no such thing as two o'clock. Just as there's no such thing as anybody's history. That's, that's, that's part of the mutual reciprocity in ontological resistance. My point is this, in order to have a community of people, which is now since the Arab slave trade global, that says, here are sentient beings who give each other the capacity for reciprocity at the level of temporality and spatiality. Here we are. There's got to be another ensemble over here of sentient beings who have no access to naming place, no access to transforming time. There's got to be that because it is semiotically impossible to know something organically. A word does not mean a thing. A word only means something similar and ultimately the, the value of a word comes from its opposition. So you actually cannot say that a human, that human is a universal category. That would make it jello. It would be a big blob. It would be without meaning. You have to be able to say what is not human and that is and, and, and this is another hijacking of Orlando Patterson, right? And her, what, what I think Orlando Patterson has done, although he, is, he hasn't done it with blackness the way we have, he said, if you have a society, the people know that they have a community only because in the last instance, there's a slave in the mind or a slave physically around. There can, everyone cannot be a human being. That is just semiotically impossible. And so, and so in order for that construction, I recognize it as a construction. I don't recognize it as being ordained by God. It is a construction. It, it feels like it's ordained by God because it starts in 625 AD with the Chinese, the Gulf Arabs, the Iranians, the Iraqis, uh, Moroccan Jews, and East Indians vamping on East India, on, on East Africa. And then they give that over to the Portuguese. So we've, we're talking about a, a thousand years of global communal building for which blackness is essential as the foil. 
And for that to continue, there has to be a constant projection of slaveness from the collective unconscious, the libidinal economy, onto the black body. And that projection cannot be pure bigotry. It cannot be pure bigotry because black people are bigoted also. <laughs> you know, we're all bigots, okay? It has to be bigotry linked with paradigmatic violence so that you can make it true. Violence is the only thing that matters essentially for thought. And that's the key. There's no such thing as black structural violence. I'm sorry, the Bloods and the Crips are bad, but the LAPD is bad, okay? <laughs> Okay, um, may I ask a question? I, uh, I see from the uh, Q&A thread that there are South Africans in, in the audience in a very different time zone, even though time is in dispute here. And um, so I, I have a question about your experience of being in South Africa and the degree to which you feel Setting aside for a minute the deeply autobiographical nature of, of this book, Afro-Pessimism, the degree to which those five years in South Africa um, built some of the building blocks for this theory of Afro-Pessimism. And, and I'll explain why I'm asking this question. Um, it seems to me that the US is very taken with its own exceptionalism. And South Africa is very taken with its own exceptionalism. Um, something that I've been thinking a good deal about as someone increasingly who straddles both of those geographies. And most particularly, I'm thinking about two sets of almost parallel histories of um, settler colonialism, indigenous genocide, chattel slavery in both places, and then efforts at reconciling a present that has to address that that history. Of course, the one distinction is that South Africa is a country with a black majority, and yet the, the contours of this concept of Afro-pessimism that you describe are equally applicable in the South African context, shockingly so. And so my question to you is if you could explore a little bit what, what inspires you about your South African experience that contributes to the way that you think about Afro-pessimism? Well, thank you very much for that question. Um, there, there have been two moments in my life which, which I think are epiphenomenal and, and really life-changing. One is, one is this moment from the age of 12 in uh, 1968 to uh, the age of, of about 15. Um, um, and, and Mainly, I spent traveling with my parents. My mother was working on her PhD, and my dad was doing sabbaticals. And I saw the the world in revolt in the United States, which I did not see in Minneapolis. I thought that I was suffering in this isolated hellhole of a rich white neighborhood, um, and that I had no right to feel the kind of rage that I that I that I felt. Number one, number two, I felt like any middle-class black Negro that something I should be doing better. Um, and I did not have an analysis. Um, I, and I only knew as I wrote, wrote in the book that I was energized by destruction, very energized by burnings, by cities burning, by looting, but I didn't have anything to connect that energy to. And coming to Detroit, Chicago, Seattle, Berkeley, California, from 68 through the end of 1970, I met people who were in college, who were taking it upon themselves to train kids between the ages of 12 and 18 years old actively, train them as anti-imperialist revolutionaries, to make us read books above our reading level. Um, and so that then sent me back to Minneapolis with the will to never compromise and externalize my rage rather than internalizing it. You know, South Africa did pretty much the same thing. Um, I had, I had never been. I had it had been a long time. I get to South Africa in '89. 
I spent two months there. I go back in 91, spent two months there. And at the end of 91, I moved there for, 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 for over five years. And in this period, uh, what I, so the first answer, the first part of the answer to your question is what it gave me was energy and affect, okay? In other words, I, I think that South Africa and, and, and the period in the 60s and 70s gave me the stomach and the feel to um, stop voting, for example, to never be um, alive to the euphoria of the moment in November every four years, um, to stay the course and condemn America and never actually entertain any conversation about its possible redemption, even at, you know, and so and so I kind of I kind of wait for black people sometimes because because I had to do this I had to do one of these things right the night before Obama was elected at an all black place and it was you know so it gave me that also the seriousness of people talking about destroying the state and de-linking from global political economy. This is before Mandela gets out of prison. Okay, we're writing position papers, which I hope some archivist has, has kept in Shell House, you know, about how to take the entire frontline states and figure out what you resources you have in Mozambique and what do you have in Zimbabwe, what resources we have in South Africa and set up a, a Southern African barter system and give the middle finger to the World Bank and the IMF and default on the apartheid loans and capture the central bank and and you know put the apartheid generals up against the wall and 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 execute them all you know this was the this was the energy this was the talk that i had never been part of you know then at the end when the when the when the when the when the, when, when the um what i would call internal forces help the conservative party and western money assassinate chris hani when when mandela marginalizes and demonizes Winnie mandela and we see the great purge the great purge begins in about 93 after the death of chris hani and a hundred thousand people leave the disaffected or actively are purged so the rules of card carrying members goes from 350,000 down to 250,000. in that period what I began to see was at my level. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a political apparatchik of what's called sub-regional level. I, I'm elected to the sub-regional political junta for the 16 townships of Johannesburg and Johannesburg Central. Then there's the regional level, which is the province. And then there's the national level. So I'm below the regional level and above the branch level in terms of my elected position. At that moment, I begin to see people like myself at the sub-regional levels having conversations with people that we were in violent conflict with, I must admit, people in the PAC, people in Azapo. And we begin talking about the sellout of our respective parties. We begin talking about how, even if capitalism is destroyed, which our leaders don't want, right? There will still be anti-Blackness. And so I, that was, that was really, uh, as, I, as I said in one interview, uh, my first wife, who's South African, says to me, why has the RAND plummeted all of a sudden after the votes, right, the, non, the non-racial votes, when the country's economic fundamentals have not changed? And I was like, okay, now I'm a dedicated Marxist at that moment. I'm doing political education for the Communist Party and for the... Uh, the underground cell I'm working with and for the workers library. And I don't want to hear about black, you know, so I'm trying to argue with her, but it is disturbing because what it shows me is that the world now has changed and it sees a black country. It doesn't see a white country. And this is why I was saying to, to Joseph, the line between political economy and, and liberal economy is a false, is a methodological division line. So then I, I so I, I think that that was important. And, and going back to your earlier statement I'll end right here, there were uh, secret caches of, of weapons that um, I saw uh, uh, secreted away, but there are also caches of books which could get you 18 months in prison if you own these books. And these books, over 70% of these books were from Black America. In other words, the works of the Panthers the, the, and the Black Americas, the works of Fanon, the works of Angela Davis, Asada Shakur later on. And so what 
this just goes back to your opening statement. There was this kind of cross pollination, pollination, which really actually goes back to the NAACP and the creation of the, a the ANC a long time ago. And so those are those are the things. I think what South Africa did for me most of all was to steal my reserve, my resolve rather, to steal my resolve, so that I never came back to this country trying to be a citizen. I'm always in it and against it. And that was very helpful. So I think I'll ask maybe one or two more questions and then we'll go to the uh, questions from the, uh, from, from, from the audience. Um, thank you so much for that. I, I have a question. Um, well, I have several questions. I wanna kind of change it maybe to thinking about genre, right? To thinking about the genre of, of Afro-pessimism. Um, and so, well, this may be two questions in one, but I, I'm thinking about, um, there's, there, there's obviously a legacy within kind of writings, um, literary productions, and, you know, of, of black authors like a Du Bois, Audre Lorde, that, were, that are multi genre And I, I just want to take seriously um, Afro-pessimism as, as memoir, autobiography, essay, theory. I mean, is there some, some way in which, um, I guess the first question is, I mean, does that multi-genre work? I mean, is that like, is that, is that an important kind of maybe ethical, right, political kind of strategy? Um, I guess the second question is, you talk about Afro-pessimism as, as the meta theory in, in, in the new book, right? And you suggest that, right, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's looking at the assumptive logics of critical theory, right? Psychoanalysis, Marxism and so forth, right? And, but what's so interesting to me is that even though you're saying that it's operating on that kind of abstract structural level, you have two, uh, you know, two, you know, fascinating books uh, and your and your and your avoir, right? That are that are deeply about, right? About right, uh, person that are personal, right? That are about interpersonal relationships, autobiography, um, the authority of the eye in a certain way. And so, I'm just, I'm, I just say something about that relationship between the meta and just uh, I, maybe just lived experience, which I know, I don't know if that's the, I don't know if you like that term, but it does seem to me that lived experience and not only, uh, you know, just like as examples but to get us to see just the mundaneness, I guess, and the kind of the way, the mundaneness of anti-blackness, anti-black violence, but also the ways in which, right, in those mundane spaces, a certain kind of hostility, right, a kind of, uh, these kind of, you know, affective regimes, right, get directed towards black bodies. But anyway, yeah. Well, help me, because I, I, there's, there's a lot there. And, and, and you know me, I can just go here, here. So just drive me to one, so one aspect of this slide. So the, the main thing is, I guess the one thing is, um, thinking about, I mean, I guess I'll just ask one, like, what is, what is it, what is it about memoir, right? What is it about autobiography, right? Which, I mean, you write so beautifully in that form. And I'm wondering, what are the tensions maybe between, uh, or, you know, not, 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 not contradictions, but what are the tensions maybe between that and kind of thinking about Afro-pessimism at a meta level and the kind of concerns that right black people don't right black people don't have access to something like subjectivity right and it seems right. to me that i mean traditionally uh, right i mean there's a way in which autobiography right has been very much an expression of a certain kind of authorial eye and something you know i big eye right but i hope that makes sense if yeah. not can I, can I so, jump in here for a minute can i ask a, a second part to piggyback and then we'll be done with our questions which is i wonder if one can flip the question on its head and say well you know, enlightenment theory, or let me call it boldly white theory, <laughs> always starts with lived experience, but just doesn't acknowledge that that's the case, that there is a kind of, uh, how to say, hierarchy of value in increasingly abstracting from lived experience out into meta theory or, or concept. And that really theory, is very often hiding behind the fact of something that is very particular, very specific, but doesn't perform itself as such. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, thank you very much, both of you. That's that's precisely you know when I when I write my second book, hey, I'm talking at Duke, and two out of three have been published at Duke. <laughs> but I must I must say though, I must say, Incognito, two black women at South and Press, save that book from the dustbin of history. And uh, Jocelyn Burrell and Asha Tal. So, and then later Duke picked it up. Right. So yeah, I, I that point that that in the bourgeois memoir, 
theory is hiding and doesn't announce itself. That's very, that's very key to, to if I hear you correctly, it is, yeah. And, and what I, so I have to do several things like, like in the second book that, that Duke published, Red, White and Black Cinema and Structural Abuse Antagonisms, I'm trying to speak in an analytic voice and make an argument about political economy, liberal economy, structural violence and film. But I'm also in these other two books, and, and Joseph, this is this is getting to, to your part of the question. Um, I have to admit that I am seduced by the pleasures of narrative. Just like I'm seduced by Hollywood movies. That's, you know, and my and my, <laughs> so I I'm I'm not by being an Afro-pessimist, I'm not, I haven't matured emotionally. Uh, my God, <laughs> I'm just a bundle of failures. I mean, you'd be, if you, if, you, if you had a teenage son, you'd be, you know, and you wanted a, a male figure, you'd have to look somewhere else. I'm just Prozac and depression. That's all, that's, that's, that's the sum total of my existence, okay? I mean, so what, what I'm trying to do is to have this attempt at psychic integration through writing and then show how that's impossible because there's no denouement to a black story. And so that's, that's it's, but it's not trying to get above it and to be superior to a narrative that will not let me in. It's just constantly trying to inhabit it and then finding out, oh my God, what we need to be a subject of narrative is an element of loss, plenitude and then loss. And blackness does not provide loss unless you think of it as a cultural identity. This is the intervention. What, we're, what I'm trying to say is that, um, and, and this is this work on, on the Arab slave trade in, in East Africa is work that I've learned from graduate students. Since I wrote my book, you know, it's work I've learned, I've learned from people like Varisa Paziri uh, um, in at, at Cornell, who you know, and, and Salamala Terefe, who's from uh, Ethiopia, is that what's interesting about 625 AD through the 1400s is that vamping on black bodies by the Arab world was not for the economic industrialization primarily, but what it did is it helped to construct a filial identity, what it means to be an Arab in contradistinction to what it means to be black. And that's really, that's really important to me. So what I think of is, is, is I have to, in writing a type of memoir and a, and what, which is incognito, and then writing this book, Afro-Pessimism, which is auto, auto theory, the I voice wants something presence, wholeness, psychic integrity, reciprocity, recognition and incorporation. And then it's like the whole book is about that moment on the train with Fanon and you find, look, a Negro, and you're divided into three. That's what I, what I dwell on is the failure of a desire to become human and not a failure that is vested in black psyches and black bodies. It's a, it's a foreclosure because our foreclosure from that is actually, is actually necessary. So I, th I think that um, I would be remiss if I said, because narrative requires a subject who once had plenitude and then has lost and then can be redeemed and because that narrative arc is not available to, to the black, I am gonna castigate myself for being seduced by it and have nothing to do with it. My goodness, I'm still paying off $80,000 to Columbia for a master's in fine arts in bourgeois fiction writing. <laughs> you know, what, what a waste of money. <laughs> you know, all, my, all my cultural manifestations come from the 1950s. I mean, so I mean, I have to, I have to recognize, you know, this desire and then work through its impossibility and show that on the page. Well, if I may say that MFA is absolutely not wasted because there are so many moments in Afro-pessimism that are frankly deeply visual and enable the reader to 
see, literally see things that they themselves may not have experienced for a variety of reasons, including generational, you know, uh, differences. So not so fast. <laughs> um, there are a lot of questions from the audience. So I'm going to take a stab at uh, curating the first one, which is, um, and there are a number uh, a bit like this one, but um, this question goes as follows. Um, what would your response be to the critique that an Afro-pessimistic view centers the white, defines the white world as the world, and yes, that whites wield violence to create and maintain their power and their world, but perhaps that's not the only world. Yes, well, <laughs> um, that's a, yeah, I get that all the time. Um, I, I think it's I think it's even worse than that. I, I, I think what what Afro pessimism does is it, is it says that to be to be human, which is which is different than white. In other words, all colored immigrants as well as white people are get their presence through the distinction between themselves and, and blacks. And that that needs to be um, ritually reenacted uh, through, through, through violence. I, you know, I think you, you or Joe asked a question earlier in which I, I don't remember, who, but I was saying that there are many different paradigms of oppression, you know, and Afro-pessimism doesn't say, these other paradigms of oppression don't exist, um, but what it, but what I would, I would, I would struggle with the questioner a little bit if we were in class together, because I simply do not believe that uh, the libidinal economy, the collective unconscious of anti-blackness, is out there and not something that constitutes the unconscious of black people also. Uh, and I and I and I refer to uh, the works of David Marriott, especially in Haunted Life, um, but also in uh, On Black Men, where he writes about uh, photography and lynching, and then France Fanon's War. And one of the most important things that that he that he questions is: Can we actually say that the black unconscious is an unconscious? if it is impossible for the unconscious mind, this is very different than the pre-conscious and conscious mind, for the unconscious mind to aspire to a black ideal. So what, in other words, the argument is that I look in the mirror and my conscious mind says, I'm black and I'm proud, I got it going on. But my unconscious mind is saying, you are a stimulus to anxiety. You give yourself anxiety, Others get anxiety from you. You, not your words, not your ideas like the Jews or non-Black feminists or colored immigrants, not your ideas, not your agenda, your flesh stimulates anxiety. And it doesn't stimulate anxiety for others alone, it stimulates anxiety for you. And that's what the whole opening chapter of my book is about. When I talk about 20 years ago, being 44 years old, having a psychotic episode, my fundamental concern in the psych ward at UC Berkeley would be, how can I get better? But because I'm catatonic, I'm crying and moaning and this big 215 black mass of matted hair and red eyes, and all I care about essentially, not totally, but all I care about essentially is the fact that I'm scaring the hell out of this white doctor and this white nurse. And so I would challenge someone to explain to me how something other than the anti-black gaze, how the anti-black gaze does not cut through one's own internal psyche. I would actually say that that has to be proven to me. I don't believe that that's the case. I, be, I do believe we can get over it, but I believe that you cannot actually write a sentence about what the other side looks like or know exactly how that will happen because the kind of violence needed to end anti-Blackness will end the epistemological formation of the world. So, uh, Professor, was, but it's one, of the, one of the things that I've been very fascinated with is, is your is your kind of lifelong work as, a, as, as an activist. So one of the questions, so some of the questions here have to do with um, the pragmatics of, of, um, 
of Afro-pessimism. And I know you've talked about the kind of Anglo-American pragmatism, um, but you know, there's a set, set of questions here around um, you know, issue, solutions, um, pragmatics, and also what do you, someone asked, what do you say to those who say Afro-pessimism um, interferes with or undermines the possibility of coalition, of coalition politics? Uh, I, I wouldn't say anything to them, to that, that latter person. They got to talk to me. I'm black. <laughs> I, I owe nobody nothing. <laughs> you know, it, it's the coalition that owes us an explanation as to why it cannot shift away from tangible goals like immigrant rights into the, 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 the demand that blackness embodies, which is the end of the world. I don't have to explain to the coalition a goddamn thing. The coalition owes the black everything. Uh, and, and, and it would seem to me that black people are so generous. We, we were generous in this election. We've been, we were, we're generous in there's this, you know, this, this thing called Ubuntu. Um, which is a, 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 a Bantu phrase meaning goodwill or brotherly and sisterly love, you know. Um, this, this Ubuntu that saturates the diaspora uh, is something that the coalition takes advantage of. We enter into the coalition in political movements that will liberate us in part. In other words, a movement that could end capital would liberate part of our suffering. It would eliminate all the working class suffering. You know, uh, getting the Indians their land back, getting this, the, the, the Palestinians their land. Back. We enter into all these things which are partially liberating for us and totally liberating for other people. And they have the nerve to ask us to attend to their cognitive map. No, their job is to change their cognitive map, come over to blackness and deal with a totalizing iconoclastic movement. What was the other thing about politics? I don't remember. Uh, I mean, that was, so other, other questions were around, um, you know, around the kind of, you know, are there, are, are Afro-pessimist interests, or is your version of Afro-pessimism interested in, let's say something like practical solutions, or something like that, that was one. But I, I'm thinking about that in light of some of the things that you've said recently about what you call Anglo-American kind of pragmatism. Um, oh, you know, but but it's not as if like you're not. I, so I want to think about that, but I also want to think seriously about the ways in which you've, you know, you've talked about the importance of activism as well, particularly around Black Lives Matter. So anyway, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I I am. Um, <clears throat> I believe to be human is an, is to be is to occupy an unethical place, um, because you cannot be human without without the technologies of anti blackness regenerating what the constituent elements of humanness are. Um, but I also believe that, that black people are sentient beings, even though we don't have access to the world. And as sentient beings, we, you know, we think, we act, we, and we suffer on multiple planes. And so I've always been involved in the alleviation of suffering on, on, on multiple planes. I've even, I'm even dedicated to engaging black people whose tactical response to our suffering is not mine. I, uh, 12 years ago, almost to the day, I uh, gave a, I was on a book tour for Incognito, and it was the night before Obama was to, to get elected. And I was in a room of 80, 80 people, 78 of who were black in the black neighborhood in Brooklyn at Medgar Evers College. Everyone had an Obama button on. They said, who are you gonna vote for? And I said, the last milk toast Negro I voted for was Nelson Mandela. And I will not make that mistake again. You know, I do not vote. I'm not, I'm not against Obama. I'm against the president. I'm against the country. And, and I said, so let's talk black to black. How many people, raise your hand, would be so excited that we cross the river over to Manhattan and have a ticker tape parade for the first black person to drop an atomic bomb on a city. Raise your hand. Nobody raised their hand. I said, okay, well then that's what an American president is, an assassin, the head of Murder Incorporated, okay? And so that's number one. Number two, Figures like Mandela and Obama, because I was there to I was there to read from my book and then to do, do a comparison of, of Mandela and Obama, and they thought I was going to celebrate both of them. 
<laughs> that was a disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> so these, you know, back in the day, these two Miltos Negroes wouldn't make it to the front stage. It's the fact that COINTELPRO killed everybody. It's the fact that Chris Hani was assassinated. The fact that Winnie Mandela was marginalized. The fact that there, were, that there are purges that I saw in the ANC that you would not believe. This is how these reach across the aisle Negroes rise up to power, okay? Through the murder of the people who speak with and for us. That's number one. And so I said, number two, um, so let's let's um, let's talk about this, you know. And we had a wonderful conversation. I said, I am here. In food, I'm so happy whenever Black people have joy. I was. I I caught my dad votes. He's a Democrat. I called him to celebrate his joy, not to celebrate goddamn uh, the neoliberal corpse and 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 Kamala Harris, you know. No, to celebrate. Black joy, because Black people have so little joy. But I'm also against the country, because the country is organically against us. And I had the most wonderful conversation the night before Manda uh, sorry, Obama was elected with this intra-Black community, where we all seemed to recognize what I was saying, even though people were going to vote. The, the next day, I wasn't trying to change people's mind. They weren't trying to change, change mine. So, so I'm always in the space where black reform is happening. Because if in that space, there are not other kinds of colored people and they're not white people, then what I have found in the space of black reform, like the night at Medgar Evers or in Black Lives Matter workshops is that people are doing on the ground reforms and we're having, and they're inviting me in to talk about Afro-pessimism, which doesn't, click with reform because we recognize that we suffer and we're here to talk about black suffering even though we we you know i would never say go to harlem and organize everybody for the final objective of the end of the world give me a break no that's ridiculous but what i do love about black space which is not contaminated by other perspectives is the fact that we can all talk about these things without having to worry about the white gaze. The very next night after Medgar Evers, I was so alive to the beauty of that conversation because what happened after that? I did a book signing and I was 52 years old, 2008, 52 years old. And this woman comes up to me. She says, I want you to sign my book. She's in her late sixties. And she says, but before I do, I want, to t I, want, I want to hear, I want to tell you, I want you, I want to ask you something about that. I want to say something to you about that not voting thing that you just said. And I thought to myself, oh my God. Here it comes, you know. And so my, my whole my whole Louisiana manners came back to me, you know, yes, ma'am, no ma'am, you know. And she looked around and she put the book down. She goes, I'm a nurse at the hospital in Manhattan across the river, and I hate this country. And I hate voting and I hate everything about it. And I am so happy you said that. And I wish I could go to the I'm, I'm gonna go to the hospital tomorrow and tell those white people that and 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 and, and think. I said, no, no way. I would advise you not to go to the hospital and tell you and tell your white folks that tomorrow. Okay. I said, because I'm 52 years old. I've only had a tenure track job for two years. That's how that's the kind of shit my mouth has gotten my ass into. <laughs> you know, and I got an academic freedom clause in my contract, so I can say whatever the hell I want to. You don't have that. They will fire you and send you to the Bronx, you know. So um, black speech is always incarcerated talking. It's always speech under coercion. Coercion. There's no such thing as a free black voice. And I was just, um, I was just so grateful that, um, that with this all black room, we could live with the contradiction. This woman with an Obama button on, leaning over, whispering how much she, you know, in her late sixties, how much she hates this country and how much, how futile she thinks voting is and how we never get anything back when we give everything every four years. And, and that's all I care about. I don't need her to go and burn down the hospital tomorrow. This will happen gradually. Okay. So um, we have a question, um, which I think is, if I'm reading it correctly, I think is about certain forms of, um, black social death that are maybe delayed. And so the question here is about 
could you elaborate on questions of black social death that are possibly self-generated or intracommunal? And the examples that are offered are in the case of Margaret Garner or the mass suicide at Igbo Landing. Are these exceptional instances too or embodiments of Afro-pessimism? It's a good question, but I don't have an answer for it. I don't, I don't, I, I, it, it, it's really, it's really beyond my thinking mode right now. I think it's very fascinating, but I'd stumble bumble for about 15 minutes. Uh, maybe the person can write me an email and we'll try to, but I'd like to hear you and Joe sort of answer if you have any ideas. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know where to begin. <laughs> I don't think I have any answers, although I have recently been reading Kristen Smith, who's at UT Austin, who writes specifically about forms of delayed death. So as in the case of Eric Garner's mother, um, particularly women who may not themselves be directly the subject of say police brutality, but in confrontation with um, loss, um, sons, brothers, sisters, whoever, um, that there is this strange delay between the immediacy of that death and then there is also death. And, and Chris, uh, Kristen Smith refers to this as sequelae, um, a kind of morbidity that sets in over time and, and can be seen in, in many instances. So I don't know if that's the answer to the question, but it's a really, um, it's, a, it's a fascinating way of thinking about it anyway. Thank you very much. I really didn't quite grasp the, the question and you helped me there. And yeah, I like your, I like, I like your answer very much, yes. Joe, I think it's your turn. It's a question um, about, I mean, you kind of, you kind of answered this. Um, so if this doesn't generate anything, um, there, there's a question about the kind of, um, we well, kind of answered, I mean, I'm just, there's a question about this last weekend, right? And the kind of, um, right, the kind of joy around um, or the relief maybe around, um, you know, uh, you know, voting, voting Trump, out, uh, voting Trump out of office. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm going to combine that uh, a certain question with something I, I've, I've thought about. You talk about Afro pessimism as a kind of ethical, right? A kind of ethical, right? Um, at least in, in the cinema book, there seems to be it's, it's, it, there's, it's a, there's a kind of ethics there. In so far as you're thinking about um, the, the, the various the various modes of violence that are constitutive of civil society, right? And so I'm wondering, what are the ethics of pessimism in a moment of right? In a moment, you, you, you talked about black joy, but I'm thinking about right the ways in which um, the joy of this moment, right, the energy of this moment, and the way that it's it's always already being corralled to do the work of like you know, nation state building, right, um, U.S. exceptionalism, and so forth. And so I'm wondering about the ethics of pessimism. Right at a moment like this, right? But an ethics of pessimism that maybe is 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 actually maybe beyond some kind of optimism pessimism dualism, right? I I, I actually think that there's like that the ethics of pessimism at this moment is 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 actually not only a reminder of the right the fact that whoever's in office is this kind of structural violence that enables right even the transition, um, but also a kind of ethics that's always like it does seem to me that's always animated by the desire. For the possibility of the end of the world is something radically different. Even if you've said in interviews, um, we can't we can't necessarily name what that radically other world on the other side of things would be. I don't know if that made any sense, but just uh, pin, hit me with it as a because because I, I feel myself going here or there. So help me with like a very straightforward quick, quick question. I guess I'm. I'm So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking here about one of the questions, I'm also thinking about certain conversations that I've seen on like social media about, um, again, about, right, you know, this is a moment of hope, right? And the energy, uh, like this is a moment of hope and energy. And you suggest, you, and the, the reason why I'm, maybe I'm, I'm, just, I'm just repeating a question or what you said just a few minutes ago, that you're interested in black joy, right? And that you are interested in black joy. But I guess I'm wondering about the ethics of pessimism Right? The ethics of pessimism at a moment where joy, right, the kind of energy and the hope 
is always already being kind of hijacked and corralled to do the work of U.S. exceptionalism, to do the work of forgetfulness, and 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 frankly, right, yeah, to do to, to yeah to do the work of kind of furthering right, um, you know, imperial modes of being. Okay, so there. So I'm not. I'm going to address your question briefly. I, I probably won't really answer it, but now that I understand the contours, um, so I think I think the first thing is you know th this um, this book is now in like Barnes and Nobles and bookstores. Okay, um, that's nothing that that you know uh, when I when Anna, Anna Maria asked me about South Africa back in the '90s. Uh, when Jared Sexton, Sora Han, uh, Kiana Ross, who's at, at uh, Northwestern, and then later on Patrice Douglas and people were were, were starting to think about this. Um, this wasn't really about a pessimism that is linked to emotions. It was it was a it was in Gramscian terms. And see and see now that it's in the popular culture, popular milieu, people think of it as a emotional dispensation. And I would hope that, that people would take, when they had the word Afro-pessimism, that essentially they would take an emotional pessimism out of that because it's a, it's a Gramscian pessimism. Gramscian said, I have a, a pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. So what he was saying is, it, it, you know, like in his notes on Italian history, where he talks about the formation of the, of, of the Italian state is very much like a moment now where you have people killing each other, the action party and another party, I forget the name of, you know, in the prison notebooks. And he says, it looks like a civil war. It looks like a blood and guts, guts um, manifestation of essentially irreconcilable agendas. And he's going, no, 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 people, people are dying. People are being shot. People are killing each other. But there's nothing essential being argued over. It's just two phases of capitalism. The working class is going to be subjected regardless, you know. And so that's what an American revolution is, even at a, uh, sorry, an, an American e election is, even at a moment like this, where, where people are armed with guns, you know. It's a, at best, it's it's a, it's a passive revolution. And so what he was pessimistic about was the thinking, the cognitive maps that went into that blood and guts uh, conflict that formed the Italian state, the cognitive map that said, wow, something essential has changed. And so we're pessimistic about the cognitive maps that say something essential has changed or something essential can change. And the cognitive map that of Marxism that says, when you get rid of capitalism, you'll, the world will be free. No, you'll still have social debt, right? I've been to Cuba, which I love. The core of Cuban identity is anti-Blackness. I went to the Soviet Union in 1973 because they were funding all the people I loved all around the world. And I was just a Soviet apparatchet at, at the age of 17. And, and I was just shattered by the anti-Blackness that I saw in Moscow, you know? It's a necessary element to the epistemological formation of the day. And so we're pessimistic about the cognitive maps of liberation that come out of that. It's not an emotion. So the joy, the joy, the joy that I would celebrate you know, I would celebrate the joy, like my father's joy of, because I don't want it's an 89 year old man whose father was in, you know, Frank Senior was in Louisiana, who thought if I go up against the Klan, like he did in the 1940s and formed the NAACP and he, had, he was attacked and all this other stuff. And if I form this organization and risk my life, something will change. And then my father thinking, if I do this thing at the universities and make them open to black people and, and have all this affirmative action, this training, something will change. I just, I just, I, the people in North Carolina in 1789 who thought we are workers, hyper exploited workers, and all of a sudden 1800 to 1835 come along and they rip a million black people from the ages of 15 to 25 from the Eastern seaboard and send them in coffles down and, and intensify their suffering, you know? All the time, generation after generation, we keep hoping something will change. We hook our star to something. I just wanted my dad to die with that illusion, okay? Because he deserves it. <laughs> you know, I don't, I, I don't want to browbeat him with Afro pessimism. You know, I just, I'm just, I'm happy that that he can say, well, goddamn, you know, if I die, you know, before my 90th birthday, at least, you know, 
uh, uh, Trump won't be in office. Now, to me, that doesn't make any essential difference. It makes important differences, like for the climate, for COVID, you know, important differences. It does not make any essential difference. And I'm a revolutionary. My dad is not. Okay. I, I want that joy. I want him to be happy. Just like, just like in Minneapolis, the people 20 blocks from him who burned down the police station, I want that joy also, okay? <laughs> That's, you know, no form of anger management. That's what Afro-pessimism releases. So this is an interesting one. And in a way, I think it answers a question that I've had for a while. So, um, you know, in Angela Davis's um, freedom is a constant struggle, she's doing this thing that I call trying to world the struggle, right, by connecting Ferguson, Palestine, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So the question here is about um, this Palestinian insurgent at the beginning of the book. Um, you know, why is their insurgency always already grounded in anti-blackness? I think that that's the question. Um, and then the, it goes on, the question goes on to, to ask the following, which is, you know, about the, the condition of a, an anti-colonial struggle, which is essentially the Palestinian struggle. Um, so, you know, I think that the person posing this question is asking, is Palestinian insurgency ultimately, um, a really, well, not exactly a bankrupt project, but something that has to reject the appeal to the human. Um, and of course, as you said, right at the beginning of your reading, right, um, there is this, this problem that um, for black people, for black subjects, there is a nothingness. And so you can't really make claims about sovereignty which is what Palestinians are doing. It's also in a sense, right, what African uh, liberation fighters in places perhaps outside of the South African struggle may have imagined that they were doing in the attempt at liberation and independence. In any case, the question here is about the, the status of the Palestinian insurgent. Well, what I do in my work is I, I find the most sacred left-wing causes and I pick on them. <laughs> you I'm having fun today. <laughs> because I wanna shit on the inspiration of these kind of sacred notions of, of, of you know, I mean, I've struggled for Palestinian independence for, you know, since the 80s. And I'm, I'm, I'm as rapidly anti-Israeli as I am rapidly anti-American. That does not believe, that does not, that does not mean that I believe that a Palestinian state will somehow be free of anti-Blackness because the point of the, of the example in the beginning of the book is that anti-Blackness constitutes the constituent elements of what it means to be alive. Not what it means to be alive in Palestinian or be alive in Israeli, to be alive. And so I, and, and that that is, so, so, so what I'm, so the person who asked the question, if we were in class, that person would actually have to prove to me that anti-blackness does not constitute Palestinian being before, I'm, I'm not gonna be put back on my heels uh, proving to them that it does because I've already, I've already said that there are, you know, going from the first part of Orlando Patterson's slavery and social death, he talks about different paradigms of subjugation. And he says, you need an ocean of violence to set up a paradigm of subjugation. But once the paradigm is set up, then what takes over from the gratuitous nature of the violence that set it up is a thing called hegemony. And hegemony, we know this from 1997 in scenes of subjection with respect to consent in the rape trials, hegemony is not a modality of black subjugation. There's no such thing as a black idea. That doesn't mean black people don't have ideas. What it means is that the world cannot hear a black agenda. And so 
I, so that I would say just say structurally, you would have to show, the person would have to show me how the Palestinian libidinal economy is constituted at a schematic, in a schematic way that is different than the Israeli libidinal economy. I don't think that can happen primarily because as I said at the beginning, the Arabs started this, okay? And the Palestinians are, are Arabs. So anti-Blackness is is, has its germ, and not where I thought it was in the Atlantic slave trade, but in the Arab slave trade. The next thing I would do, and I end it right here is anecdotally, just anecdotally, um, you know, when I did a, a, a workshop for Black Lives Matter, 35 uh, 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 activists in Black Lives Matter at the uh, Audubon, what we saw Audubon Ballroom on 168th Street and, and, and Broadway where Malcolm X was assassinated. And that is now the, the Shabazz uh, Foundation. Uh, I heard stories about Black Lives Matter activists who were alive to the reading of internationalism that you cite it from Angela Davis, very much alive to that. And they went to Palestine on this solidarity and they said, hey, while we're here, before they went, while we're here, we wanna meet the black Palestinians because black people in the Gaza Strip, black people in Ramallah, okay, on the West Bank. And the people are like, yeah, okay, okay. And they got there, five days go by, seven days. And they're not, they're being steered away from meeting Black Palestinians, which was the promise. And when they do meet them, what do they get symptomatically? They get the embodied complaint of Black Palestinian existence that you find in videos of Black people in Basra, that you find when talking, when I do workshops of Black people in Vienna, that you find of Black people in Venezuela, that we exist under the boot of Israeli occupation and under the boot of Palestinian anti-Blackness. And that's why nobody wanted them to talk, okay? So I don't have to prove that. The, the, the person who thinks there's something so sacred about the Palestinian struggle that it is absolved from anti-Blackness, that person has to prove that to me. Do we have time for one more question? I'll stay as long as you want. I think we have to go at six. I'll 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 see if I, I see something from uh, from Sarah. Um, I think we can do one very very briefly. Oh, okay. Well, this one I was thinking about. Do you have one? The one I'm thinking about is probably I don't know if this is a brief one, um, but I'll put I'll put it out there. So what what one one concern um, that I'm seeing here in the chat um, and that I've seen before is that. It is, is that, uh, so here, I'll just read it. Um, Afro-pessimism being a meta theory generated through experience of, right, the black male slave, right? So concerns about, right, um, you know, gender difference, um, you know, concerns about essentializing blackness. Um, I know in other other conversations I've been part of, like, where does intersectionality go with, with, with Afro-pessimism, right? And I know that this is a lot for five minutes, but it was, it was a question that was kind of, you know, maybe you could start to think through some of, some of the, some, some, of those, some of those concerns that I know that you've thought about, um, and I, yeah, anyway, I'll be quiet. Well, um, <clears throat> yeah, I, you know, I, I think that what Afro, first of all, I don't think Afro-pessimism is a discovery, like E equals MC squared. I think it is a big ear trumpet that listens to the symptoms of Black people to come up with a scaffolding, a cognitive map of suffering. Okay, and it doesn't say that the experience of suffering, qua blackness, is going to be the same whether you're transgender, male, female, straight, or gay. But it, it says the command modality is the same. Just like, you know, no, no good Marxist would say, um, um, well, you know, there are people in sweatshops who, who are women, who work on the other side of the Rio Grande, they can't use the toilet, they have no maternity leave, they can't uh, have uh, menstruation uh, supplies, they're harassed sexually by their employers, they die on the job, okay? And then there's a professor in Stockholm who has a social safety net, makes a whole lot more money, works shorter hours and not under draconian conditions. An Anglo-American Marxist would say, there's an essential difference gender, nationality, race, 
between these two, these two people. And there are important differences that need to be addressed. But if you are a theoretical cognitive mapping Marxist, you're going to realize that the extraction of surplus value and the intensification of work is the same scaffolding of, of oppression for the sweatshop woman as for the white Scandinavian man. And so that's the level of abstraction that Afro-pessimism makes its claims at. But in, in, in demonstrating these claims, the, 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 the work is all over the board. You know, I think that, that uh, you know, I think a, a uniquely Afro-pessimist work like Scenes of Subjection concentrates on Black women. But when she makes an intervention that says consent is a modality that cannot tr translate legibly to the court, she's talking about libidinal economy. And that is true of all Black people. And uh, Patrice Douglas works on different genders. You know, her, her work is, is genderized, but it's also making, not trying to make an intervention on the specificity of women's suffering as being essentially different. You know, so I, I think it's a misreading um, I think that the game Afro-pessimism, the intervention that it helps us make is not intervention of how do you live your life? How do you get over this? Um, how do you relate to each other as black people? Although it can help you with those things, but that's not the game. The, 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 the destination is to develop a language of what it means to suffer and not what it means to be alleviated from suffering because that is gonna come from black people in the streets and not from professors. I think that we are out of time. And um, just, just so you know, Frank, there are at least 75 other questions in the Q&A thread. <laughs> I believe that um, Sarah Rogers is going to send these on to you, so at least you can see them. But clearly, you stimulated an enormous amount of discussion. Yes, I'm getting a correct, that's correct. Um, an enormous amount of discussion and I think um, stimulation and, and tremendous interest in your work. And we're just so very, very grateful that you could be with us. Um, and grateful to African and African American studies and grateful to the Franklin Humanities Institute for supporting this event. And um, I think I can say on behalf of Joe and myself that we really hope that when this pandemic is over, you can actually come and visit us again as you did in 2015. So um, we're gonna make a date. <laughs> um, and to the audience, thank you so much for attending. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you, and a shout out to Tommy DeFrance and Patrice Douglas. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you, goodbye, have a nice evening.